strong inclusive communities um, and the role of uh, health and wellbeing boards um, in doing that. Um, it's, this has been a strand of um, Think Local Act Personal's work, um, I think since the outset, it's certainly one that a lot of us have, have been really passionate about. Um, the, the ideas that uh, around social capital, community capital, that, that communities could be more inclusive, we could all help each other a bit more, um, those ideas have always been a, a really um, fundamental part of um, uh, the vision for personalisation. Um, I remember uh, when John Bolton was one of the leads in the Department of Health, um, he drew me at some, de some quite fancy Department of Health conference in a, in, a, in a hotel in London, I guess pre this must have been pre-crash, um, uh, and he, he drew me the quadrants uh, of which social capital was one of the quadrants on the hotel um, tablecloth in pen, which um, I found quite surprising at the time, and he, he realised that, that it wasn't a paper tablecloth, so um, there's, a, there's a hotel from which the Department of uh, Health are forever banned in London, and they've no idea why, but it's, uh, it's because they've never got that, uh, that model out. <clears throat> but if you look, so it's, it's always been part of the vision for, um, for personalisation, but if you, if you look at um, what we can actually see in evidence, um, it's clearly, for me, unfinished business. And I think one way of reading the recent white paper in the bill is that it has a strong focus on trying to address that, that unfinished business. We've, we've seen people's understanding of personalisation get far too focused on, on services um, and within the idea of services on social care and um, not enough, uh, not broad enough in terms of thinking about um, the, the huge role that individuals, families and communities can play in, uh, in good lives. So, um, uh, my name's Alex, uh, I'm the, uh, the co-chair of the Think Local Act Personal Board, I'm also, um, for the next week only, the chair of the Care Provider Alliance, which is the um, alliance of all the independent care provider bodies, and my day job is um, with a charity called Shared Lives Plus. Um, I'll, let my, um, uh, I'll let the speakers introduce themselves. Um, uh, but we have representatives here from, um, I mean you've already met uh, Clinton um, this morning from the National Co-Production Advisory Group with Sally um, and uh, Catherine's going to be talking a bit later on. Um, Catherine's been, uh, has done a, a huge amount of the actual work in this work strand um, and um, uh, Martin is going to be talking about um, some of the history and background to that work. So. First of all, I'd like to hand over to Clinton, um, who's going to um, talk about the importance of co-production uh, in developing strong and inclusive communities. Okay. Can everyone hear me? You grow. Okay. Um, as Alex uh, said, we're going to um, look at discussion about health and wellbeing boards and co-production. And if some of you are wondering what the my last name, Farguson, it's Scottish. Just thought I'd throw that out. And I have got my, my own kilt. Okay. Um, a bit about me. Uh, practical experience of brain training, inequality and diversity issues. I'm also the co-chair of Think Local at Personal. And I was previous chair of Birmingham Link, which is the local involvement network. And I'm, uh, uh, um, and I used to be a member of Equality 2025, which looked at um, disability equality across um, uh, government departments and looking at how uh, life chances for disabled people in policy areas of health, education, uh, and um, uh, the criminal justice system, and looking at what was um, some of the, the barriers to representation in those uh, fields. and. Um, also, I'm a board member of Birmingham Health Watch, and that's, you know, why, for me, um, a community, strong community capacity is really important. You know, how do communities be part of this? So, hopefully, I'm trying to structure my, my talk around to trigger some discussions around key issues for health and wellbeing boards to think about. Uh, Two, uh, what is co-production? And three, what is uh, making it real within um, the functions of health uh, and wellbeing boards? 
and how can health and wellbeing boards benefit from co-production and making it real? Okay, the key issue for health and wellbeing boards from a perspective of people who use services, um, although uh, you know, a chair of Health Watch in all the loca uh, localities will be uh, invited to have a seat at health and wellbeing boards, one person doesn't have all the skills and knowledge to re represent the community, you know, and uh, it's how, how do you capture seldomly heard voices, you know, uh, how do, you know, because it can be perceived that you have a risk of only involving the usual suspects that sit around the table. How do you get wider representation? So, you know, how do you, you know, I like to use the, the term about how do you capture the, you know, the seldomly heard voices? Because you can't, um, you know, represent. In Birmingham, we have 1.1 million people. We can't, there isn't a room big enough to try and get everyone round the, round the table. But how do we have vehicles so people can, and the community feel part of that conversation? So, the general public, I, my test that I normally do, and I, you heard earlier, I talk about, um, you know, my beloved Birmingham City Football Club. I sometimes sit at the, the game and ask people, you know, what's your opinion of, uh, you know, have you ever heard of a JSN hang? And they go, who? Or, you know, uh, you know uh, about things like that. So, you know, joint strategic needs assessment. They think I'm off my head when I start using those type of language. So, a lot of the community are excluding. The barrier is the terminology, you know, and some people don't even know what a health and wellbeing board does. So, you know, I know as um, a representative for uh, Health Watch Birmingham, I have a role and responsibility trying to get that message out, but it's not just health and wellbeing boards' responsibility, it's everybody and the community. So how do you capture the voices that are never heard? Those are some of the... Uh, uh, things that you might want to discuss. How can you understand what is important to disabled people and older people and younger people that are often f forgotten? You know, it's like I said in my speech this morning, it's about aspirations. How are they um, caught? Because we just don't want to be cared for. We want to be able to have, you know, aspirations to do things. How does that, you know, how can we enable that to happen? So it's about looking at things like that. What is co-production? The National uh, Co-production Advisory Group came up with this um, definition. Uh, to co-produce is to make something together. Co-production is not just a word, it's not just a concept, it's a meeting of minds and coming together to share solutions. And that was, you know, um, as a group, you know, we wanted to I'm picky and plain English. That was our main goal about trying to explain uh, co-production. Because co-production, some of the ingredients of co-production is about trust. So how does health and wellbeing boards look at, you know, building and galvanising trust, you know, for the community to share ideas and, and so on and come up with the, the solutions. In practice, co-production involves people who use services, being consulted and included and working together from the start uh, to the end, you know, and the middle. So it's not just the beginning, it's also the middle and the end of discussions that uh, of a project that affects us as people who use services, carers and family, and the wider community. When co-production works best, people who use services and carers are valued by all involved as equal partners and can share power and have influence over the decision-making uh, aspect. Okay. Making it real, uh, how many people have, uh, have heard of making it real? Ah, excellent. Uh, yeah, making it real is a set of uh, 26 I statements and it was developed by people who use services carers and citizens, supporting organisations to move towards a more personalised and community-based support. It's basically what people who use services and carers would like to see, that what a service, if a service was good 
and it was using those I statements to uh, uh, portray what good looks like. That's what the ideal behind the I statements are about. Making it real benefits health and wellbeing boards. Well, uh, it can aid uh, voluntary movement for, for change. It's not a directive, but it's inspirational. But co-production, it's about the quality of conversation that is important. How do you, you know, uh, get that through to uh, the communities that, you know, they feel involved in the in decision making power? How is that devolved down? That's one of the biggest uh, issues for any organisation. How is that done? How do the community feel part, you know, not separated, part of it? Um, also, acknowledging gaps, or, uh, you know, working together to find solutions. And the connections and learnings from all these can help other localities, you know, by sharing good practice <coughs> and so on. We would encourage all health and wellbeing boards to sign up to making it real. That's the first step, you know, um, that is a journey. And we know uh, in tough times, we need something to aspire to because everyone still has dreams, hopes, and aspirations. So because you are a person who you services or carers, that doesn't dim those hopes and your dreams do not just, you know, get put out. We still want to live an ordinary life but it's about how can we all together enable that to happen. And thank you very much. Uh, so I'm Martin Rattler, people don't know me, uh, and I'm uh, working with TLAP on, on the Building Community Capacity Project. Uh, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background and a little bit of an outline of a specific initiative that Think Local Act personally is going to take with partners um, over this next six months initially with a view to uh, a, a longer term piece of work in the next financial year, assuming we're all still here uh, in the next financial year, which I'm sure we will. Um, so uh, this is the, um, the quadrant that uh, Alex talked about, the, about John Bil Bolton drawing on that, um, that tablecloth. Uh, I'm not sure how well you can see it, but remember it's got universal services, prevention, choice and control, and social capital in there. Uh, and uh, when that was developed, uh, Department of Health would have been in 2008, um, uh, th there, was, there was quite a lot uh, of description about what some of that meant, uh, but not very much about what the social capital meant. And, it, and it's become a, obviously a bigger deal uh, as we've moved into a different world over these past few years. Catherine and myself, who worked on this from the start uh, in the DH, um, uh, went kind of on a roller coaster ride, didn't we, of how interested uh, people in government were in. Uh, in, in what we did, so kind of mild interest in social capital in the early days, uh, and then uh, David Cameron started talking about the big society in the election uh, campaign, and all of a sudden we were total flavour of the month, weren't we? Uh, so we were getting called into cabinet office meetings, and, and everybody wanted to know us for a little while, uh, and then uh, big, big society kind of quietly uh, uh, quietened down, uh, but we're still here, aren't we? So uh, we've been we've been working in this area for, for a while. So what have we been doing? We've what we decided to do was, um, from the Department of Health, rather than put out some guidance, here's how you do social capital, we decided to uh, work with a number of initiatives and places to learn and share. So we worked with about 20 uh, council areas and their community partners over a period of years, uh, and we learned stuff from them. Uh, and uh, if anybody hasn't seen the building community capacity part of the Think Local Act Coastal website, recommend it, because it's got plenty of case studies and practical materials on it that are the kind of fruit of that work over those years. Um, and one of the things that we felt important to do as part of that was some work on um, measure, measuring issues around uh, cost effectiveness and impact of social capital. Because when we started uh, the work, um, you know, it, it was, uh, the, the world had just melted down. Um, and we were very clear that um, there's, a range of, uh, there's a risk of this being motherhood and apple pie. Everybody thinks community is a wonderful thing. Uh, uh, and we're, we're proposing social capital interventions at a time uh, when there's no money and uh, many of those interventions are probably at highest risk uh, from cuts in, in local places. So one of the things we were really clear about at the start is that we had to be very clear-eyed about this. So you know, there wouldn't be any point going to local decision makers and saying you need to invest in or even retain your investments in, in social capital uh, unless we could make a very strong case for that. Uh, and so we approached uh, Professor Martin Knapp at London School of Economics and we said, uh, Martin, uh, 
we haven't got any money, please help us. Um, and uh, pe so people will know that, uh, that Martin is the, uh, is the chair of the School of Social Care Research, um, and uh, he told us about an approach uh, that they've got called decision modeling, which uh, is almost like cold fusion uh, in my mind. So um, we, we, we weren't going to be able to do five-year random control trials on various types of intervention, but we needed good enough evidence that people uh, would be able to use uh, to make the case and to, and to make progress. Uh, and so he used this decision modeling tool, which I won't attempt to describe, but uh, it's a means of, uh, well, Gerald, you might describe it at some point. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Gerald is, is, uh, is one of Martin's colleagues here. But f from my point of view, it's, it's uh, a, a low cost but robust way of making a case uh, for various types of intervention. And it has been used to justify very significant investments in very significant interventions. Would that be good enough? Oh, fine. Thank you, Gerald. <laughs> okay. So um, what we're going to do next, uh, so what we're going to do next is uh, a specific initiative that's around uh, doing this. So we want to encourage and help health and well-being boards to support the inclusion and maximise the contribution of older and disabled people in local communities. That's always been part of TLAP's goal, inclusion and contribution. And, but also linked to that, we want to support boards to help people to avoid, delay or reduce the unnecessary use of acute or long-term health and social care via the building of social capital or the maintenance of social capital. Yep. So inclusion and contribution and you know, what tends to get called prevention. Okay. <clears throat> Our target here is health and well-being boards. They're the new kids on the block. Um, they've, they've come onto the block at a time when the total quantum uh, of public uh, resources in an area is significantly reduced. Um, they're going to have to work uh, and we want to help them. Now there are lots of uh, offers uh, and suggestions for health and well-being boards. It's a little bit like ev uh, everybody's got uh, 100 suggestions about how the 3.8 billion integration fund uh, should be used. Yeah, It'll get used many times over uh, in people's minds uh, over the next uh, few months, I'm sure. And similarly, everybody wants to tell health and well-being boards what they do, and they're only just getting going, uh, and, and this is a challenging time. Um, but we want to make a very specific contribution, not a general contribution, but a very specific contribution about community and social capital uh, to them. And we want to link it to other offers that are available from local government association and others. So it's not, uh, um, it's not a rival offer, it's a complementary offer. So what we're going to do, what we... What we've been working on, uh, particularly Catherine and, and our colleague Clive Miller, um, have been trying to take all the lessons uh, of the work that we've been doing in the past few years and develop um, a draft framework uh, for health and wellbeing boards. If you were trying to do those things, if you were trying to increase the contribution and inclusion of older and disabled people while achieving prevention, what kinds of interventions might you take and what strategies and tactics might you deploy to achieve that? Okay? What's our best understanding and knowledge uh, about that and how can we package that in a way in which you can uh, use it uh, in a useful way. So we've been working on a draft framework which uh, Catherine will talk to you about in a little, uh, little bit of outline in a moment. Um, framework linking to examples and evidence. Over the next six or seven months uh, we're going to be working with a group of health and well-being boards um, to try and use that framework in practice, to start to use it in practice to look at the um, strategies they have, the priorities they have, and see how they can use this framework uh, within those strategies and priorities to start to incorporate interventions, uh, uh, social capital interventions into their activity. Um, we plan to share the developing learning from the, those boards via uh, various web resources, uh, through regional health and wellbeing and personalization networks, uh, and through our work with Public Health England, who are a partner in this. I should have said this is uh, in part delivering on a, a white paper commitment that was joined between TLAP and Public Health England. Um, as we go through, and, and uh, we want, to, want you to help us with this a little bit later on, we're, we're going to be uh, also doing our best to encourage as much engagement and involvement of, of partners in this work, both in the first phase, but particularly perhaps in the second phase of work. Uh, and we'll come on to one or two of those uh, activities in a bit. So the idea is by April we'll finalise and disseminate a framework uh, via uh, the most effective routes that we can, uh, and we hope that we'll have uh, a second stage phase of work um, supporting health and wellbeing boards to apply that uh, framework in practice on a larger scale. So in practical terms, we're looking to recruit between six and, help, six and 12 
health and wellbeing boards um, by the end of October. Uh, we, uh, before the summer, we invited health and wellbeing boards to give us some uh, initial expression of interest and come to uh, a launch session. Um, from that, we've had about 18 uh, initial expressions of interest, which we're hoping to turn into work with 12 boards from around the country. Um, the, that invitation is going out to those uh, 18 boards today or tomorrow. Um, what we will offer to them uh, is uh, we, will, we will work with them uh, to uh, make that connection between uh, the ideas in the framework and their strategies and priorities. And we will agree some initial activity that we can support them to take to incorporate uh, uh, initiatives into their strategies. Uh, so the idea is we will provide them with a person to help them with that over a period of time and their own personal budget uh, to buy in uh, some uh, agreed uh, support over a period of about six months to do that. It's not large amounts of money. This is uh, working with the willing um, uh, with relatively modest amounts of money, but we hope some powerful ideas. On School of Economics, uh, Gerald and colleagues, I hope, um, uh, will be providing some evidence support into this. So uh, when we do our, original, uh, our initial uh, sessions with each of the boards, colleagues uh, from uh, Martin and Gerald's team will come with us uh, and we will identify with those boards where are the, area the areas where they would mo most find evidence useful and what is practical and possible in doing that to support them uh, in that. Uh, we're going to seek to facilitate peer support across the involved boards, uh, set up a web-based forum for exchange uh, and sharing of practice, and as I said, working to you up another partner office, offers, which we're going to come on to in a moment. It says regional elements at, at the end there. In, in the first instance, what I'm hoping to do is to work with um, existing regional networks uh, at the end of this six-month period to do at least some kind of significant local event uh, which would share the framework, the activity so far taking place in health and wellbeing boards, and also offer um, a platform for partners uh, to share relevant initiatives that link to the framework. Uh, so we're hoping Public Health England are going to stump up uh, some dosh to help us with that in the springtime. Okay, what we're expecting, we want those health and wellbeing boards to be exemplars. They've got to sign up at a cross agency senior level to use the framework to use the framework co-productively uh, and incorporate elements into a local strategy, a few things like covering some local costs, um, and uh, they've got to agree to report their outcomes and activity uh, into our redeveloped framework and our plan to go forward into the next financial year. Hi everybody, my name is Catherine Wilton. Um, as Martin said, I've been involved with the Build and Community Capacity work at Think Local App Personal, but it was first of all at the Department of Health since it sort of started really in 2009. So um, I was pleased that Martin asked me to, um, to work with uh, Think Local App Person on developing this work for health and wellbeing boards, which is a subject quite close to my heart. My husband's actually a local authority councillor, is uh, a, a lead councillor for uh, health and wellbeing himself, is just about to take on the chair of Reading's health and wellbeing board. And I've been a councillor before involved in health, so, and I've worked in the NHS, so it's a subject quite close to my heart. And I believe actually the step around community capacity, whilst my work in this field sort of started around social care. It's at the heart of the public health agenda and it cuts right across everything that we do in the public realm and beyond. So I'll kind of uh, hopefully share some of, your, some of my passion with you today. So um, when uh, we were asked to develop some ideas around basically, you know, what can health and wellbeing boards do, um, we started from the premise that um, thinking about community capacity, thinking about what people can do for themselves, co-production is is really, really important because if you ask people the question, what makes a good life for you, uh, they say things like, I want to get out and about in my community, I want to enjoy community facilities, I want to have friends, I want to be able to go down the pub when I want to, um, and they don't, first of all, say, I want really, really good, specific, this type of service. Yeah, when you kind of pro, people might start to talk about care and support and, and the services they receive, and they might start to talk about personalisation in that way. But if you're asking people what they need for a good life, which is the first question I know that a lot of you will be asking in your work, it's about those things that we all take for granted. So, and that is actually kind of, you could call a lot of that social capital. So the idea of having friends, social support networks, the ideas of trust and neighbourliness, being active, having an influence in your local area, having a role, whether that's paid work or volunteering or doing so, something to support somebody else, and just you know living in a, a cohesive community and inclusive community. So 
it, it, it is really, really important. But it's not just about that it's the right thing to do, although that's kind of where I start. Um, and yeah, so this is what Think Local App Personal talks about in terms of what is social capital. So you hear the term bandied about, and I just thought some definitions might be quite useful. So when Think Local App Personal is talking about what can health and wellbeing boards do to develop social capital, and it's in all the documents we produce, including the volunteering one that Duncan mentioned, it's looking at four different things. And there's lots of definitions, but these are the four that Think Local App Personal uses. Personal and social support networks of family and friends and neighbours. So having someone you can ask if you're in a bit of bother or you need some advice about something or you want to go down the pub. Being a member of a group, because there is evidence that associational life, that associating with others is really important for health and well-being. And there's that great statistic I like to quote by Robert Putnam, who found that, um, in fact, if you join a group and participate in it for a year, it cuts your chances of dying in the following year by half. And two groups, that's 75%. So whether you're involved in a darts group, a crochet group, you're involved in a local church, you go to Birmingham City Football Club, you talk to people on the terraces or whatever, all of those things are really, really important, being part of groups. And so what services can do, what commissioners can do to encourage people to become part of, of, sort of semi-formal groups in their community is really vitally important. Um, it's also how welcoming and inclusive the wider community is. Because there's no point in saying to people, right, you want friends, let's kind of like, you know, go with you to develop some, you know, to meet new people or whatever. If when you go to the community group and uh, you say, and, and you sit down, the community group goes, oh, sorry, that's Fred's chair. Yeah, I'm sure we all have that experience of sitting in the wrong chair. And, um, you know, basically community groups, the voluntary sector as well as the public sector needs to kind of um, take a, a really broad view of inclusion and that is sometimes just the simple things like inviting people in the first place to come along and then when they do invite, then when they do come along, giving them a good welcome. It's some of those things about being a host, being a host of a good party, that makes you a really good inclusive organisation too. Um, and lastly, whether people are able to make a contribution to community life, that absolutely does include paid work, but it's also um, having an influence and, and having a voice in the local community as well. So not only is it the right thing to do, um, but it, is, it, it actually results in better outcomes. So Martin's talked about some of the work that um, London School of Economics did for this project, which is really, really great. Um, but um, I also pulled this together, which is based on a, a literature review. This copy these at the back, by the way. Um, that a uh, colleague of uh, mine, uh, who's a GP in Lewisham, pulled together for um, the HELP project, the Health Empowerment Lever Leverage project, which is actually looking at the benefits of community development um, and what that can do for, in particular, they were interested in health outcomes. And so basically, if you've got good connections in your community, if you're a mem member of a group and you've got good social support networks, you're basically healthier, happier and less likely to die young. Simple as that. And I've put some of the references there. A lot of them are in here as well. And some of that is you know, really, really specific things where one of these studies, they followed up 500,000 people over 10 years and they've looked at death by all causes. And the people who have lots of community connections are the ones that actually um, you know, go on the longest. So some of the, the really, really important things we could do from a social justice point of view for everybody is actually to help people develop those connections. And then if you need to make the case elsewhere, this document's got some of these things in as well, because this isn't just health and social care, is it? It's about everything. It's about everything in our communities and everything in our lives. There's all sorts of evidence where you can actually kind of persuade your town planners, your environmental health officers, your police forces locally to actually join in, because there's benefits for everybody. So, you know, if you've got um, people involved in community, you get cleaner and greener neighbourhoods. It's no, um, it's no accident, is it, Alex, that B&Q have, have started Street Club. B&Q, the company, or Kingfisher PLC, have started an initiative, it's fantastic, called Street Club, where you can actually join together with your neighbours and share tools and actually get community things going on. And they'll say, really up front, the reason we're doing it is because if this neighbourhood's uh, cohesive, then we know people are going to get involved in communal DIY projects. And where are they going to buy their stuff from? So if B&Q is persuaded, then you know, I think other, other people can as well. Community safety. There's a European-wide systematic review on Neighbourhood Watch. It can reduce crime up to 25%. So Neighbourhood Watch, sometimes fashionable, perhaps less fashionable at the moment. At least it is in Reading. The police aren't putting so much uh, effort into that. But actually, just getting neighbours together and looking out for each other reduces crime, as well as all those other things, which is the reason why we're doing it. Um, 
transport, anecdotally the speed watch thing, you know, where volunteers and local communities armed with a speed camera, I know Marjorie likes doing this, doesn't she? Marjorie from the co-production group, standing on the standing on the side of the road in a you know rural area. The police can't afford can't afford the resources to police speed and traffic, but the people in that community find it is really important, and it actually does reduce um, speed of cars. And for Mar Marjorie's not too happy the fact that she can't issue a speed ticket, is she? but uh, it does slow traffic down because it you know it's actually somewhere somebody there visible saying we're going to stand up for what's important in our community. And this stuff around education, increased educational attainment in areas of high social capital. So whoever you need to convince, there will be some evidence there. Use that um, green paper there, uh, as you know, the, the, the paper in green here, to kind of spark you off to develop your own business Stop case if you need to. And uh, there's other things I'm, I thought I'd point out to you. So the New Economics Foundation looked at a, a social return on investment methodology, where you put in a kind of financial uh, amount on um, kind of some, an outcome in, in social terms. So if you invest in community development, a pound, you're getting at least three pounds in social value out. There's some kind of way of talking about it. Um, and they, the social return investment of the Holy Cross Time Bank in London found that the volunteer contributions alone were, if you had to pay for that, what the volunteers put in would have cost you £137,000 in a year because there's so many people involved in the time bank. There's so much more to say about that time bank as well because they use it actually in mental health recovery. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, and in the Game Without Pain document, that's, that's a good one to read, isn't it, um, Alex? The uh, voluntary organisation disability group is that yeah. um, Show the added value and cost savings that can be you can get out um, if you use organisations that are rooted in the community, so there's some great statistics on the Shared Lives Plus, uh, which you might want to point out in a moment, Alex. And then lastly, the Time Bank's uh, study from London School of Economics showing that Time Bank might cost £450 per head per year. But in terms of the gains, and that's just in the things that Martin Knapp and colleagues at London School of Economics looked at, the economic payoffs and reduced benefits, people getting back to work, for example, because they were able to uh, re realise and develop new skills as a result of getting involved in the time bank, could be actually worth, uh, or they have a value of £1,300 a public purse. And that's aside for any kind of gains in uh, mental well-being that the fall as a result. So why aren't, people, why aren't people using this evidence? And I think the simple thing is that maybe it hasn't been, you know, people haven't necessarily known where to look for it before. So around health commissioning, the clinical model and medical model is always paramount, isn't it? And there's lots of randomised controlled trials about this drug or that drug, and you've got NICE and everything. Um, but in terms of the, the more kind of like stuff which has perhaps in the past been perceived as woolly, you know, community development, we don't like talking about evidence, do we? Because we do it for the right reasons. But actually, the evidence is there. Um, and one of the things that Sally and Clinton are involved in, which I'm doing at the moment, is a leadership programme for senior <coughs> health and social care leaders looking at what they need to do to develop the skills to enable this kind of thing to happen locally. And um, after just one day of getting those people in a room, somebody's already written a business case and saved their service, haven't they? They told us last week. It's amazing. So just with some of these stats, she's gone away and done the research, put the business case together, and a service which was threatened with closure is now not going to be closed. Obviously, she said they're not out of the woods. They've got to continue. But the Health and Wellbeing Board, when presented with it, was like, Wow, this is great. Oh, we def that's a key part of prevention. We've definitely got to keep it. So this can be powerful stuff. So, what should health and wellbeing boards do? Um, we've got the framework. Clive Miller and I from OPM actually developed that. Um, but we think, well, for a start, it's a draft, so we're really interested in your ideas. And secondly, we think that we probably all do share the same ideas about what health and wellbeing boards, in their unique position of getting together all the key, key players in one place, with the, um, the sort of dimension of the political uh, involvement in that as well, locally, um, and with the direction of travel in terms of integration and some of the stuff that uh, all parties, in fact, are saying about even more integration in the future. I know uh, Andy Byrne has been talking about uh, bringing together health and social care, all, all that commissioning in, in, in one place, and whether that happens or not, I don't know, but it, it definitely is the future. So if you were to have to write this framework, um, what do you think health and wellbeing boards should and could do to get some of this stuff on the agenda of everybody that impacts on the health and wellbeing, particularly of older and disabled people in an area? The draft framework, um, we were asked, uh, myself and Clive Miller from the Office of Public Land Management, were asked uh, to develop this framework 
And again, this is a, a, a diagram which sort of explains a little bit about um, what I was saying before, which was um, starting from a point of view of there being lots of assets in local communities, so that idea that there are strengths, not just needs out there. And that's really about a change of mindset, isn't it? We're used to joint strategic needs assessments, but actually, does anyone do assets assessments? Mm -hmm. And some of those assets, if you look at people in people of communities, are almost unlimited, but it's just about enabling people to make that contribution. And actually, public authorities in particular, opening their eyes to the contribution that others can make. They don't have all the answers themselves. There's two aspects that we're talking about. One is um, about inclusive communities, so the wider stuff around community development. And the other one is co-production. So it's how do individual services redesign themselves uh, to be based on a model of co-production. So the Holy Cross Time Bank being a, a, an example of that. But in, in all sorts of ways, how can you increase the co-production of particular services? Um, and the outcomes, like I said before, uh, with what we, how we argue is improved health and well-being, stronger communities. And in terms of your re resources, uh, we, we kind of say that that could reduce demand and actually increase the assets and strengths in communities because you're kind of you're giving voice to them. So the draft framework uh, includes the rationale, which I've sort of gone through today, explains the benefits of redesigning and tailoring public services uh, and building social capital. And it does signpost to the evidence and examples. Um, so somebody mentioned case studies, and we do believe that's very important. Uh, the thing's going to be web-based so that you can read the uh, headlines, but then if you want the case studies, you go into a link which kind of takes you a bit further, because not everybody wants uh, the, the very large document. Uh, and it's sort of six sections, and a lot of those things that you've mentioned will fit neatly into those sections. So the first one's about focusing on assets and needs. So we're saying, for example, using bottom-up community asset mapping processes. There's lots of different types of those things. The HELP project's doing it that I mentioned before. Uh, some work done by the Asset-Based uh, Community Development Foundation, ABCD network. Uh, there's lots of different ways of doing it, but you know, we're talking about community development, really, something which uh, you know, became unfashionable. What we're saying is that's key. Um, provide community and cross-sector leadership. Um, and so whether that's about developing the, the leadership you've got or changing the way that leaders see their role to facilitate rather than actually to do everything and not have all the answers. And so what you need is championing and cha championing good practice and being able to challenge uh, practice in, in, and across work, across sectors, so not just health and social care. Promoting the vision and shaping the strategy. So Clinton talked about making it real and Martin talked about how we want making it real embedded in there. There are tools that build it that um, the project's already developed. So, for example, does it work? Which is a, a way of actually maybe evaluating something you're already doing to see if it's uh, building community capacity. And there's another one which I'm afraid we haven't got copies of today, but you can get it off the website called Are We There Yet? Which helps you map everything that's going on in a community. So that might be a place to start, and certainly might be something that the Office of Health and Wellbeing boards might um, might start with. Then lastly then, shaping priorities around building stronger communities. So where and how to invest in these things. Coordinate cross-sector involvement. Again, that kind of uh, speaks to what that person was saying before about it being representatives from housing and, and outside social care, etc. And then actually sharing the learning. So um, that, I've got some slides on how it links to making it real. Perhaps these could be shared afterwards because I know we're running out of time. We just wanted some examples. If you don't know what time banks do, does anyone know what time banks do? Yeah? So there's a way of sharing skills in a community, and I've talked about the financial benefits. I'm starting a time like myself in Reading, and I've got to say, we've signed up 70 people, and we haven't come across one person who doesn't think it's a good idea to do something for somebody else. So cynics, cynics uh, leave at this point, because it's, you know, people out there really, really want to do something. They're just never given the platform to do it. And lots of housing associations and housing authorities get involved in time banking. Um, uh, this is a quote from one, one of those in Cardiff and saying that actually it was, a, it was the first time that people had seen themselves as an asset because they were doing something to help run our housing association and they're earning time credits as a result which they could spend on going to rugby games in Cardiff. They couldn't afford them before and they were actually felt that they were rewarded in something other than money. This is a, an example of just how working together can get you something amazing. So this is a group of disaffected teenagers who are annoying all the older people living on an estate uh, the older people were living in houses with big gardens. It was costing the local authority a lot of money to maintain the gardens. The older people were worried they couldn't actually cope in their gardens anymore. Again, that could be a trigger to move into residential care where the costs are higher. 
So what they did is they asked these young people what they wanted to do, and they wanted something useful to do. They've engaged the local college and the police force who were involved in trying to sort out the antisocial behaviour to say what can we do. And they came up with a project called Green Fingers, um, and this was about uh, uh, these guys doing a, an NVQ in horticulture in the local college. Um, and whilst they were doing that, they were actually maintaining all the gardens and green spaces on the estate, saved the authority hundreds of thousands of pounds. And they would do really, really good projects, seen as assets in their communities by the older people. Really, really great links made between people of all generations in that community. Um, but why were they doing it, you ask? Because isn't, isn't it easier to hang around on a street corner, like writing graffiti on a bus stop? Well, because they were rewarded by getting free driving lessons from the local police. So it's, a, it's about that reciprocity sort of idea. And it's a fantastic idea. It didn't, you know, it doesn't take, it didn't really take all that much money. Um, and lastly, this one's from Reading. Uh, we've got a velodrome in Reading. And this is um, making the most of a, a universal facility. So it's, it's about uh, people uh, being able to um, use the velodrome. And so a little bit of effort put into an accessible session uh, where people, wheelchair users or different disabilities could actually use that and uh, use the velodrome alongside other cyclists. So again, just building connections in the community, but something which was already there. You don't, obviously if you haven't got a bel velodrome, don't go build one. <laughs> but you've got loads of assets and, and, and things in your community that are perhaps underused by people, um, by, by disabled and older people, and it's about making the most of them. What I wanted to take away from this session um, is that, uh, something that was brought up first by Martin Farron earlier, which and, and it struck me actually there was similarity between Clinton talking to his fellow football fans and what Martin was trying to do in bringing together this complex strategic partnership. And both of you, both of you were talking about keeping it simple. Um, we've got something which is supposed to start with people's lives, start with good lives, which is a very simple concept, um, and it attracts jargon like uh, you know an untended jam jar attracts flies. Um, and I think we, we heard first from Clinton about stripping that back, about some really simple suggestions around this horrible term, in my view, co-production. It's, you know, it's not a term that trips off the tongue. I much prefer, and I, I may have got this wrong, but the gist of working together to make something happen. Yeah. You know, we can all get our heads around that. That is a simple concept. And then that's been developed in um, this programme. Martin was telling us about the fact that this is a programme to try and do something very specific, to take this, again, this huge swirling agenda, health and wellbeing boards, they're going to be asked to do a thousand things. What do we do to try and cut through that? But thank you for all those contributions, which again, felt to me like they were really clear, they were really grounded, and they're exactly the sorts of ideas that we need to take forward in this programme, so that we don't get bogged down um, in the language of JSNAs and HWBs, um, and things which mean, uh, which say nothing to me about my life, um, as somebody once said, but um, that we can actually make a tangible difference in a very specific area. So do keep, stick with us on this, we know it's hard, and we're going to be grateful for your participation, and thanks very much for, for joining with the session.